I'm Wayne Carey, and this is The Truth Hurts. Well, it was a battle that defined football in the 90s when centre-half forward and centre-half back went toe-to-toe for 120 minutes. He's a guest who our listeners have been calling for right since day one. Wayne, I think it's it's time you introduced him. Well, it's fair to say that uh, this is because we've had so many messages saying, I'd love you to have a chat to your great adversary and the guy that beat you more than you beat him. And, and here we are, the great... Four-time best and fairest winner, 276 games, Hall of Famer, four-time best and fairest. So a fair, I think two-time All-Australian, absolute superstar of the competition. And Anton, <laughs> now you know how I feel and how intimidating this man is, the great Glenn Jakovic. Have a look at the buffet on him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yes. he is very, very intimidating. And I, I always like to say this with Jacko, and Jacko knows, and he's one of the biggest names in the game. Oh, he, was the, he was the premiership ambassador when the, when the grand final was in Perth not long ago. Superstar in Perth. But let's be honest, he's big, Here over, we go. He, Here we go. He's big <laughs> over there, but the only reason, a bit like, bit like um, not George Foreman, what's his name? Joe Frazier. Oh, yeah. Like. So Joe Frazier, <laughs> the only reason why you know Joe Frazier is because of Muhammad Ali. And I like to say the only reason why people know Glenn Jakovic is because of Wayne Carey. And, and that's why he's known in these parts of uh, the world because he took down the king. All right. It is your program. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Duff, uh, the truth does hurt. Um, but, uh, look, um, yeah, well, it's a great time to play footy. Uh, I get a lot of people, and, and thanks for having me on the on the podcast. Uh, yeah, I, I get a lot of people still today. If, all right, it was um, – 20 odd years ago since we played on each other and um, even uh, some budding football fans come up to me now and they've seen the highlights and uh, they weren't even born when me and you were running around strutting our stuff and you were smelling like, um, well, what's that fragrance that you wear? (laughs) You used to put, you used to put on that much fragrance. You were the best smelling footballer. Uh, in in the in the AFL at the time, I still can't believe it. I guess that's why I played so close to you because I wanted to find out what the <laughs> cologne was. But I get I get some of these young uh, young um, footy fans that uh, they say, "Gee, I've gone back and watched the highlights and wish footy was like that today." Because they don't. There's no one on one contests anymore. Uh, we two players play on each other for you know for eighty to hundred minutes. So uh, it was a good time, Duck. I, I really enjoyed it, and um, I look back now with a lot of fond memories. Well, I might have gone overboard with uh, cologne, but you went overboard with the oil. And, <laughs> I, and, I, and, I, and I went I, I, just to. We'll go back and talk about your, your junior career as well because it was unbelievable playing for WA at the age of seventeen. But when I, I'd go out onto the ground when you were playing on this man. And, and let's be honest, you played on some big defenders, but I literally would walk out. He had that much oil on, but I'd just look at him and go, his legs were as big as my body. Like literally, and I'd be looking at his legs going, how am I going to shift this bloke off the footy? And then you'd look at his arms and then he'd, he'd, he'd rub up against you and all the oil would rub up. But I, I think it might have been a tactic to make my hands slippery. It, it's interesting because here I'm talking about how well you smelled and you're talking about how well I looked. Any chance we could actually play footy or uh, as, our, as our mind actually on the game, we're actually, uh, I don't know, we, we're kind of uh, getting in touch with our feminine side of each other, uh, Duck. But uh, I look, <laughs> I guess back then uh, we had a lot of Friday night footy games and Melbourne was bloody cold. And I just remember, um, I think it was Billy Billy Southern. He says, yeah, young fella, get this on to you, you know. And they used to put um, the oil on you, but it was it had a lot of liniment in there as well. And I thought, gee, this is good. It just got me going a bit, you know. It was like, you know, when you put Vicks on your chest, it was, <laughs> Billy used to rub it all around your neck and everywhere, you know. So it was singing a bit. And I thought, gee, you know, uh, on a Friday night at the MCG or Waverley in Arctic Park, it, it certainly came in handy. But the boys uh, thought, Jack, oh, you've taken it a bit too far. We're playing at Subiaco Oval. It's 32 <laughs> degrees, and I'll put still the same amount on it. So. Well, all oil and cologne aside, Jacko, we do want to go through your football journey. Um, it, it began early, too, for you as a 16-year-old in, in the waffle. You, you began uh, as a Ford as well. That's, I mean, one thing, you know, a lot of probably 
newer listeners maybe wouldn't have known, given we know you as a as a defender. We end up. I was a utility. You end up. You end up as, as a defender. Usually, you're a failed forward. So that's that's generally how it I was. Wait, I was waiting for that. I mean, I was Mister Fix It. I could play forward. I could play back. Um, I looked at and, um, my uh, introduction to waffle footy was. Uh, uh, every kid's dream that whether they're playing in the Sandfield or the VFL, um, you get to play for the club that you supported in your in your zoned area. And so South Fremantle was a big, um, you know, a big football club uh, in the Waffle days. Um, uh, you know, big supporter base and so forth, and a massive rivalry with East Fremantle. Um, so my two idols coming through the early '80s were Stephen Michaels and Morris Rioli, the great Morris who passed away, and. Um, I guess my the greatest uh, um, achievement or, um, you know, idolising, you know, players like Morris Rioli, he went to Richmond, then came back to South, and Willie Senior, uh, the father of Junior at Port Adelaide, and uh, Greg Turner and I debuted round one, 1989, and Morris Rioli was our captain. He let us out, and he says, no, nah, boys, you three lead us out. And we hadn't won at Leaderville Oval since the 80 Premiership year. So it was nine years later, South copped a fair few beltings. So everyone marvels at, you know, Sybil at Hawthorne, you know, Dean Rioli at Essendon. They all have a story that they got to play with the Riolis. Well, I got to play with two um, in the one year. Well, we played together for two years in 89, 1990. So, um Morris was a Golden Glove boxer, so he used to take boxing sessions um, down in the in the gym area. They had a um, a make up uh, boxing ring with ropes and and so forth, and he used to put us young fellas through some paces. So he had big Waco Mark Jackson uh, was there a couple of years before. So boxing was a was a big thing about a bit of self defence, a bit of awareness in you know. Um, in a brutal game, football back then in the 80s, you know, you, you had to have your wits about yourself. And me, Willie and Greg were 16 and 17 respectively. So we had to look after ourselves. And Morris took us underneath his wing and said, you know, you're good footballers, you've got good skills in that. But he says, you guys have got to toughen up. You know, you're, you're, you're very green and raw and your baby face. So, and I look back at that. That was my grounding because whatever Morris said, we did, you know, and we, we spent hours on boxing sessions and, you know, just discipline training and our progression from there really increased. What about, so mentally, Jacko, so take us back in that time because I, when I started and you've got Matthew Larkin and Peter German and, and you had Phil Cracker and that there as well and Donald McDonald, yep. Jason, all of these older guys and, you know, I'll admit you, you are intimidated. You go in and you, you, you don't know whether you, you can speak to those guys. You sit over at your locker Take us how you felt, like you just mentioned some pretty big names. Were you conf- yeah. were you a really confident kid when you first went in or, or that Yeah, I, I, I was pretty confident and probably too confident and um, I probably, you know, had a, a, a bit of a reputation playing juniors because I was so dominant in junior footy. Is that, you were, were you, a, a, you're a big kid, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. So I, I developed, I was pretty much this size when I was uh, 15 years of age, so... <laughs> Less, less the uh, the guts at the minute. But um, <laughs> so I dominated a lot of uh, schoolboy footy, Colts footy, under 18s, under 16 championships. And then, you know, I was ready to play league, but I had a body ready for it. Uh, obviously, mine, you know, is trailing a fair way behind. Um, but during that period, I guess what, you know, um, changed my life a fair bit was uh, my old man got crook uh, one day and nine weeks later passed away from stage four cancer. So it really upset the whole family dynamics. And basically I had to leave school, uh, run a market garden um, that was still half full of uh, produce, um, training at five o'clock, getting home at nine o'clock and in the garden at five in the morning the next day. So, and I just had to do it. Um, you know, the old man had passed and me and mum had to kind of pick up the pieces and, and see where, you know, um, I guess a, a pretty, um, you know, difficult situation, but we worked through it and football was my out. So, and I started to, you know, play some good footy and um, I was progressing pretty quickly. I was in a good environment. And the other um, big factor there was I had a great mentor in Stan Magro, who was the coach of South Fremantle at the time, ex-Collingwood champion. Uh, and Stan was a 
um, he was a man's man. Um, he loved uh, putting on players, uh, uh, players' tees after a Thursday night training, soup nights. Sunday morning was uh, training after a Saturday game. And the Sunday morning was training was pretty pretty solid, but then Stan organised um, a, a hat. Everyone put in five bucks, and then they went and got a, um, a 20 uh, gallon keg, and you had to drink that before 12 o'clock. So I'm not sure if that uh, is uh, <laughs> appropriate these days. I was 16, and um, you know, they offered me alcohol, but I elected not to drink because I had this bigger vision that I want to have a big footy career, and I just didn't look at you know um uh, guys getting absolutely polexed on a sunday afternoon after working all week training all week playing and then sunday was there out and i could understand it that was the culture back then but uh but stan was uh, a great you know he was a great uh, leader of men we played off in a grand final that year unfortunately we lost to claremont um and we it was just a great introduction to you know waffle footy uh, for myself so the following year, um, quite astonishing really when you think back now because players aren't drafted even until they're 18. You weren't even playing for West Coast and you were playing, made your debut as a 17-year-old for, uh, for WA. H- how was that experience for you at the time? Yeah, I was a, I was a player. Uh, I didn't probably deserve to play um, State of Origin at the time. And what I mean by that, my form was really good uh, in, in, the, in the waffle. Uh, Ronald Alexander uh, was the coach of WA, and a lot of uh, AFL players, VFL, AFL players, uh, although it was AFL, sorry, 1990, were getting injured um, and, you know, proper injuries, um, and they were short in the big man department. So I, I probably got about four or five BOGs in the waffle, uh, playing centre-half or duck, you know, kicking three or four goals, <laughs> going in the ruck, going centre-half back. I was going I was going really well. I mean, I was loving footy. Um, I was an apprentice motor mechanic, um, got my first car. So I was earning, I think I was earning 112 bucks a week as a mechanic uh, after tax. Um, and South were paying me, uh, I think it was 125 bucks a game uh, if you won and 75 bucks if you lost. So that 50 bucks a win was, you know, it was a massive incentive yeah. back then, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, I was, I was kind of uh, enjoying life and uh, my form was really good and and then someone wrote in the paper. So the media, you know, love them or loathe them. Um, the headline was, um, Alexander should play a young Jakovic in the state of origin. And I couldn't believe it, you know, like everyone, all my mates were saying, how good is this and everything. And I just felt really embarrassed. I thought, well, I haven't earned the right to play state of origin uh, at all. I've played, you know, a handful of, I think by then I probably played about nearly 30 games of waffle. Yeah. So... Anyhow, uh, I got invited to training uh, with Ron Alexander and um, it was just awesome. You know, John Dorotich came to train and um, you had all the ex-VFL, um, AFL players, uh, or current players, sorry, coming back to train. Um, so John Dorotich, South Fremantle boy, uh, playing at Carlton. Um, it was just, you know, you kid like in a, in a lolly shop. You're just going, how good is this? You know, two years ago, I was playing Colts footy here. I'm... You know, at the Wacker, training on a Tuesday night, um, Ben Allen, you had Nicky Winmar, you had all these great um, Western Australians that were playing AFL footy at the time. And here I get the opportunity and Ron Alexander said, look, we're going to give you a go, start you on the bench. And I played on a Danny Frawley duck. I started centre half forward and I took about three masks because I was that shit scared of uh, uh, (laughs) Spud. He was that big and he was just roaring. And I just got out in the lead because, you know, when you're 17, you're nimble, uh, you, you know, you're pretty uh, pretty enthusiastic. So I, I got a couple of nice touches early. And he said to me, he said, listen here, young fella, you do that again. <laughs> he says, I'm just going to punch you straight in the head. <laughs> and sure enough, I did that. And sure enough, Spud done that, you know. So, but, Duck, um, I, probably my greatest, and a lot of people won't, you know, especially the footballers today, they'll never experience this, but I'm playing on Spud for Orly. To the left of me is Timmy Watson. To the right of me is Tony Boyd from Collingwood. I look behind me, you've got Tony Lockett in the goal square. You've got Dermot Brewer in the forward pocket. And I forget, I think it was um, um, oh, the Richmond, the, uh, Dale, uh, the flea, wait. Oh, yeah. He's, yep. he's, he's resting uh, Rover in the pocket. 
because Buddha Hocking was in the, in the guts. And I'm looking behind me going, I'm actually playing with these absolute superstars of the VFL. You get Darren Mullane on the wing. And I'm going, no, nah, this is just crazy, you know. Um, I just wanted to get their um, autograph. Gary Ablett, Gary Ablett Senior was on the other wing, then floating through it, uh, you know, uh, full forward. And one of, you know, in your footy career, we have many highs, Duck, but you have a few regrets. So I don't know if this is a regret, but State of Origin was massive for us, right? Mm. So it's my first State of Origin Guernsey, which I've still got. So after the siren, we got belted by about 70 odd points. After the siren, it was traditional to swap jumpers, you know, and who's right next to me? Number five, Gary Ablett. He turns to me and he's already got his jumper half off. Oh, no. Oh, and I've, you did I've, de- I've, I've declined. The oh. <laughs> I've declined. I said, look, uh, it's my first one. Sorry. And he looked at me as if to say, He's a smart ass shit. No, okay. So he moved on and he swapped it with someone else. So I'm still trying to get a hold of Gary if I can still stop it now in retrospect 30 odd years later. I was going to say, as good as, uh, you, as good as you've been and as good as you are, <laughs> that jumper, if you'd swap that jumper, I reckon that might be worth a little bit more than your WA one. Oh, yeah, I, I, I'll agree with you there, Doug. <laughs> so, well, yeah, and there's my first two years of uh, Waffle Senior Footy and I got drafted later that year. Well, that meant that your first battle with Wayne wasn't too far away. And Wayne, I guess I want to ask you first. It was in round 12, 1992 at the G. West Coast won by 44 points. Do you remember it? Do you remember it firstly? Uh, did, I, did I get uh, reported for hitting you in that game? Was that the first? That was the uh, the infamous night that um, I met the great Wayne Carey uh, in the middle of the MCG. Yeah, so I should have got a I should have got a free kick. I remember that <laughs> in the goal square, and the, and you know I should have got a free kick. It was oh yeah. I've seen that. So, I've actually seen the replay of this, and it was one hundred percent. And I looked at the umpire. It might have been Russ. I, I don't know, but I I didn't have a great relationship already with the umpires. And, and just let's just say I gave him the best sucker punch. <laughs> So and, he, and so the great man fell for it. Yeah, he so, got up. He was filthy. Retaliate. And I, I, I'm just waiting for the umpire to hand the ball to Duck and put me on the mark. And he's gone, ball up. And Ducks just wasn't happy with that. So he thought he'd just punch me in the arm. <laughs> so he's punched me in the arm. Uh, 50 metre penalty got reported. We go down. I remember Dean kept kicked the goal. And uh, anyhow, me and Duck were into each other. I, I squirted some water on him. He squirted some water back on me because the trainers come at us. And it was on. It was on uh, like Donkey Kong. And um, after the game, I'll never forget it. Um, we had won. So, yeah, I'm struck my chest out. And, you know, I thought, who's this, you know, who's this guy, number 18 from North Melbourne? He's got the strut. Uh, this is actually going all right. He's taking a few marks, but I, I settled him down after half time because I wasn't playing on him until after half time. He's causing us a bit of havoc. So Mick made the good move, put me on there, and I just quieted the great man down. But we had this little incident. And then after the game, Duck came over and shook my hand. You know, well, not really, but he came over to shake my hand, but to make a point. He says, I remember, he says, um, those who throw stones in glass houses because he knew that I sucker punched him and he says, I'll see you next year because we weren't playing on each other. I don't think we're going to play each other. We had only the one game and I don't think these guys were in finals contention. It was middle of the year. So I thought, oh, yeah, good on you, you know. Yeah. So He certainly did see you next year. year. So this, the second oh, yeah. meeting, I've got this down, round 12 yeah. the following year at the Wacker. <laughs> North won by six points. 21 disposals, 11 marks, three goals. So he's obviously pretty happy with himself. And yep. mem- memorable too for you, for you had a pretty fearsome coach at the time in Mick Malthouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, anyhow, a big game. And the Kangas, it was first year Dennis Pagan, and uh, the Kangas were on fire in the competition. They were the, you know, the new trendsetters. Uh, I think uh, Wayne Schimmelbus was your coach last, the previous yep. year. Yep. So he was- got. He got sacked yep. and there was a bit of turmoil. A young Dennis Pagan comes in and straight away instant success for the Kings. I think he's won about eight or nine on the trot. Yeah, is we're, it on, to we're say on top of the time? ladder for a lot of the year in yeah. 93. Um, so anyhow, the Kangas come into town. Uh, we're the reigning premiers. And the Kangas come in, the, in to town. And I just remember um, the media, you know, building the game up a bit. A little bit of talk about me and Wayne, but it was more about 
the Kangaroos, uh, their form, and West Coast really want to be on their guard tonight. And we thought, well, we're at the Wacko. You know, it was our domain. No one beats us there. Um, I just remember we used to park at the uh, at the, the trots over the road that I'm walking with Peter Sumich. And um, at the time, uh, well, Danny Laidley was uh, uh, had left West Coast and gone to North. And North bus had just arrived and they're all getting off. And I mean, Summer saw Danny and uh, we thought we'd say hello, you know, just because he was our teammate the year before. And he absolutely ripped strips off us. He told us where to go, F you, this, that, use blokes, I can stink. Because he was filthy, kind of, that he missed out of the grand final, got traded out and so forth. And we just thought, mate, we're just saying hello to you in the car park. But the mindset of the kangaroos was really fierce. And I guess you saw what happened, you know, um, the, in the ingredients that were probably set with from D- Dennis Pagan and the mentality, win at all costs, don't give your opposition anything. If you see them in the street, step on them, you know, hit them and abuse them and all that type of, you know, stuff, which we probably can't talk about today. But and I, I just remember that incident crossing path with, you know, um, Dean Laley at the time. Um, anyhow, the Kangas came out just, uh, it was a ferocious game and, Duck was all over me. He was just leading me up the ground. And uh, and he kept saying, he says, I told you I was going to get you. And he was kicking goals and he kept talking to me and he was trash talking to me. And I was trying to punch him and, you know, whoosh is coming over. And there was spot fires everywhere. But the Kangas got up and won. And uh, I'll never forget the post-game uh, uh, meeting that we had with Mick. So we've lost at home. We're the reigning premiers. This thing called, you know, uh, premiership hangovers starting to grow in the media and especially in Victoria. And funny enough, Mick, you know, sat everyone down and he's just taking the paint off the, you know, off, off the, uh, off the walls. And he's going through every play and I'm thinking, oh shit, you know, I've had a dirty night. Ducks kicked three or four. He's taken 15 marks on me and uh, he's BOG and we've lost by a goal. Anyhow, he's going through every player, you know, this one, not bad, not bad, got into him and the bakes are okay. They're not, really bad and i'm in the middle and i can just see it's coming it's just coming right <laughs> anyhow right next to me was uh, guy mckenna he's giving guy a bit of a uh, tune then it's me and then it's michael brennan and he's just gone from bluey to uh michael brennan he's missed me and i thought oh maybe i didn't play that bad <laughs> <laughs> so here i'm you know so he's just kept going and kept going and he's gone right down to the end locker and he's getting towards the end i'm thinking this is all done no, no, he saved the last, best or last. He's come straight back to me and he's gone exactly like this now. He says, listen here, you. And he says, that, that play you played on, he says, uh, all the all the uh, media interviews you had during the week and the build-up and you're strutting yourself around fucking town and he says, you're, you're you know, it, it, yeah, um, you're pretty happy about yourself. He says, see that guy? He says, he's going to be a superstar of the competition. He says, he's going to be around for the next 10 years. You learn to beat him. Well, guess what, Glenn? I'll find someone that can. And then just moved on straight to the locker rooms. <laughs> so it was a pretty harsh assessment. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, um, I, mate, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a good time to be playing footy because it was, it was brutal. It was honest. The feedback was, you know, and that's where the rivalry started with us and the Kangaroos and me and Wayne. Pretty much the little incident at the MCG the year before, but that Friday night game at the WACA, uh, North Melbourne arrived. Um, Wayne Carey certainly arrived during that year, probably the year before. I think you won the, the F&B the year before as well, Duck. Um, and North were, you know, they were on the rise. We were probably the, the best team in the competition at, at that time. And it, it was it was just, uh, it was good footy. It took on a life of its own though, didn't it? From that point on whenever we played against one another from that point knowing that obviously west coast were well they were in the argument to be the the best team of the 90s like we are and i think the other one was uh who was the other one uh Essendon, adelaide, uh, pretty adelaide. good adelaide won a couple of flags but yeah i remember every single time we then played you had pago would be coming up to me saying you know how to you, you play this bloke you got to do this you got to do that and then it was it was in the paper so the build up how did how did you given that you're playing on a superstar just about every week. So, yep. you know, h- how did you handle that? And did, at times, you get overawed? Or did you think you you, yeah. you went to another level? Can you remember? 
Yeah, I do, Duck. It was really good. My first year, 91, um, I played in a space of five weeks. I played on uh, Barry Stone, who was the best in half forward at the time before he broke his leg. Stewie Lowe, different type of player. Bucket strength, you know, takes marks left, right and centre. Stephen Kernahan uh, the following week. Paul Salmon, who was, you know, Centre half forward Ruckman, but he was big in different ways uh, and strong over 100. So I was playing on these guys that played 100 plus games, played in premierships, played finals at the MCG in front of 100,000 people. And, you know, I'm, I'm playing my fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth league game. And, you know, my 20th league game, I play on a, on a young Wayne Carey coming through. So I had great coaches and Mick was, Mick was just a great coach. He coached the individual and uh, emotionally and then your technical side. He he knew what you had was got given to you by your parents. He just had to um, nurture that and grow it and get, you know, the um, the mistakes out of your game or their bad habits. But then you look at your team, Duck, like North Melbourne, similar to probably yourself for the, probably the first two or three years, you know, no Kerry, no North Melbourne. Well, you dismiss that pretty quickly uh, in the coming years because – you had good players around you. Um, obviously, you were a central part of the Kangaroos, Duck. But at West Coast, we had a we had about seven absolute superstars with Dean Cam, you know, Guy McKenna, Peter Matera on the wing, Chris Maywaring, who I rated very highly, um, Peter Sumich, who kicked 111 goals the year before, um, Brett Hetty, who's absolute superstar, uh, kicked 80, I think 70 goals off a half forward flank uh, in that grand final year 91 so when you got good players around you and mick controlled the egos um you just you wind the the toy the key at the back of the toy and let it go and that that was that was mick's coaching i reckon just and then you know knew when to pull you up and um redirect you but yeah it was it was really um when i look back at my career and and i talk about these great uh rivals who we had in the 90s if it wasn't for the team and environment that I was playing in, I've got that to be grateful and thankful for. So, but do you want to speak about '93? Because after that round eleven uh, clash, final. where you belt, be, be, beat me at the um, at the Wacker, we played each other in elimination final at Waverley. Do you, do you want to talk about that one? We, we, I do. I remember it well because I went in with an injury. <laughs> um, I had a back I had a back injury, and then I actually did my. I think I might have uh, hurt my hamstring during the actual game, but. Before I went off the ground, I was getting, I was getting a little bit of a touch up. In actual fact, I couldn't get anywhere near it. Um, I mean, you guys, you guys beat us comfortably. I, I, I think it, for memory, and that was it was unusual because we were on top of the ladder for most of the year, and then end up in an elimination final against the the premier from the year before. So, yep. I do remember it. Um, I remember it very well. So you don't need to remind me, but I. One thing that you wouldn't know, Anton, about the battles, and this is what a lot of people, a lot of questions that, that have, have come through, and that is that a lot of the time our battles didn't dictate who won the game. So the player that, if Jacko beat me, we would, we've would we won games and vice versa, games where I got on top of Jacko, um, West Coast actually won the game. So the, the battle itself sometimes didn't have a bearing. The one and that's a reflection of... The, the depth of both teams. I mean, West Coast probably the well, definitely in that first half of the 90s were the dominant team of the uh, uh, competition and the Kangas certainly from 95 uh, onwards uh, were the dominant team. So when you look at the players around that I played with, um, you know, there's four Hall of Famers there. Uh, Duck, same with, with his uh, with his group of guys. So that, that that's, a, that's a testament to both Dennis and Mick and building those two teams that were... I think played in six six grand finals out of the out of that decade, and um, you know two each. So yeah, it was uh, it was pretty special. The question that I had for for both of you here is because I mean, fair to say the man next to me does have a fairly healthy ego. And oh and yeah, do you reckon? <laughs> Not, <laughs> when we were, we were actually we were thinking about doing a toughest opponents list, and he couldn't come past. He couldn't go past two names because he thought oh, I only ever got beaten by about two blokes. <laughs> Uh, the question I have, I'll start with you, Wayne, it, it, because you would have realised that, that Jacko you know, was starting to become a, a pretty tough opponent. How did you approach each game against him thinking you could get him? What were you doing maybe differently against Jacko? And then I'll, I'll throw to you, Jacko, as well. What, what were your strengths 
against Glenn? Well, I, I knew what I had to do. Unfortunately, I uh, couldn't execute it the exact right way every time we played against one another. But my, my strength was probably uh, probably more mobile, I would say. Jacko was yep. uh, stronger. So the argument was always, everyone used to say, why do you get into these wrestles with Glenn Jakovic? Because clearly, you, you know, he beats you when you get into those situations. So when I got on my bike, obviously I could uh, get a bit of the ball. But Jacko was ter- a really fit guy as well. That's not taking anything away from his mobility. He, he could run and, and more importantly, he could get the footy. So the other thing that, and the reason why I rate Jacko as highly as I do, is because he could not only negate you, but then he wins the footy. And the last message that you want from a coach, especially yeah, yeah. Dennis Pagan, is when he comes out and he's telling you <laughs> that the centre half back is dominating and, and getting the ball. But for me, it was it was just get around the ground. So that that was the key to beating him. Unfortunately, the Kangaroos we played we played a very predictable game style. West Coast obviously knew that, and we did bomb the ball a lot. So uh, partly I was to blame at times, but also our game plan I think was also played into the fact that, you know, bomb the ball to bomb the ball to duck, get it in quickly. And and guys like Jacko and McKenna and, and Woosher and Brennan and and McIntosh and these guys, they they knew exactly what we were going to do. And um, you know, one on one, he's he's uh, obviously the tough toughest opponent I've had. So clearly that that's not what you wanted to do. Unfortunately I couldn't uh, execute it all the time. Well, speaking of running off, Jack, I, I was going through the stats. There was one game, round 21-94. Uh, I think you kept him to one round goal. 21-94. Yeah, at the Wacker, West Coast by nine points. Uh, 29 disposals. You had 29 disposals that day, Jacko. Was that till half time or was that the <laughs> 29, did he? How did he get 29? How, how many did I have? Was he just, uh, no, not many that day. I think he had about 10 touches. I must have been injured again. <laughs> what was what was going on there? Was was that a was that a focus of yours? Did you think you could get in the other way, Jack, at times, or was it not that sort of game? Uh, I think no, I don't think I know what Duck just mentioned. Is summarised it pretty much to a T. Um, the way North played, it was they they bombed it in, and but they had not only just Wayne down there, they had, they had some notable forwards that could catch the ball and cause some havoc. But Wayne, obviously, being a generational player, well, what when you you know, Wayne mentioned be predictable. When you're that good, you definitely are predictable. Try and beat you, you know, try and beat us. Uh, and that was the same with West Coast. I mean, we were a heavily defensive side, but we attacked. We attacked from that half back line. We just got on the bike. So Wayne said that, you know, when I negated him and beat him, I'd go and get my own footy. You can only do that if you've got, you know, people around you that are going to cover you and you instill confidence. I mean, like, you know, at the top of the program, I said, we're all confident we have to be confident to survive in this game to play you got to back yourself but when i've got ash mcintosh behind me you know guy mckenna who was slick um the biggest thing that we had a focus on if you go and roll the dice and get the ball you got to hit a target uh on the wing or half forward and don't let that thing come over back over your head because you, then you put you know michael brennan Ash McIntosh, John Walsford under pressure. So not only win it is one thing, it's what you do with it. It was a high premium that we put on our back six. Um, and, you know, if you didn't, well, you were going to cop it from Michael Brennan, who was the vice captain. Monkey wasn't scared to give a couple of bakes if you just peeled off, took a bounce, and then sprayed one, you know, because he just absolutely tear strips off you because they're going to cop it. They're going to, you know, they're under enormous siege because then it's, then it's 5v6. Um, and you know, when you're playing the site likes of North Melbourne, even Carlton at that time, um, you're gonna get you're gonna get cooked. So so our focus was, yep, to do that, win your own contest, neutralize it, and then win your own footy. And Mick was big on that. He he felt that uh West Coast's great success was off the half back line and penetrate the ball in. And then obviously you had Matera and Main Wearing uh, uh Kemp and Pike who are good ball deliverers. So we we had good coverage. I bought I actually I had you sitting in on this for one reason, Anton, not to bring up stats like that for starters. <laughs> I thought I thought you'd at least bring up a, a game where I, you know, might have kicked four or five or or something like that. Not when he had twenty nine, but there were no. And that, like I said, when Dennis Pagan would send out the message and say, you know, what are you, son, what are you doing? And I, the, the runner didn't exactly talk about giving a bake. 
the runner. I'll never forget. <laughs> you Actually, told that runner a few times where to go. And this is <laughs> see him on his way out. I just look at him and go, mate, what are you? What are you doing? I know exactly what the message was going to be, and he just <laughs> turned around and run back. But uh, answer to add, add to that, um, Wayne's biggest strength I felt was his uh, at times with me in particular. No, definitely not with other games, but was his probably his Achilles heel a, a few times because Wayne was an all-round footballer that was very physical, very strong at the contest, big pack marks. Um, every time we went to a contest, Wayne tried to mark it, go through the contest and take whatever is in front of him, whether it's his own teammate or a, a West Coast you know player sitting underneath it. So I had to make a decision. Do I peel off? and hope that he doesn't mark it and the ball hits the ground and then try and attack from that. But you don't do that against, you know, the players like Wayne because he'll mark it. So um, his ability to move around the ground, you know, was was quite instrumental and uh, you could see how he was so dominant. He'd go up and then turn you on a sixpence and his pace was was a concern for me because I wasn't as you know, I, I wasn't a quick player. I could get around, but I wasn't that explosive player that Wayne was. But the, the beauty was is, uh, you know, the media says uh, Kerry's not strong enough, not strong enough. And I, I reckon that that uh, dented Wayne's uh, pride a bit, uh, that he's not strong enough against Jacoby. He's not strong enough. We're, 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 clearly, Wayne was very, very strong. He was very physical, very strong. I may have had him on the edge there a little bit, but it's probably easier to do that when you're sitting under a high ball and I can push him underneath the line of the ball. He can't run at it. He had to sit there and try and outmark. So that's where I got my advantage. Then the runner would come out and say, don't wrestle him. You're not strong enough. And when he said that, <laughs> Wayne nearly punched the runner in the head one day. He's chasing him because he got that filthy. And I thought, that's how I got it. So on those you know occasions that I did have a bit of success against Wayne, I think the ego, the media, the analogy or thought that Wayne wasn't strong enough against me hurt the great man. When he does, there were some games. I've got a few games where he kicked kicked fives or, you know, one game where he kicked three goals, four. Um, But a a few games where he's getting multiple shots on goal. How how do you adjust when you're playing on a player of that stature and, and he's really rolling? Yeah, look, I think there was one game. At the MCG, um, there's no places to hide at the MCG, and that was in 94. It was a game before the one that you you mentioned about the stats, I think 29 at the Wacker. Wayne kicked five of me at the MCG, and it was built up World War Three because we played on each other twice. He'd won one, I'd won one um, in 93. So the first game in 1994. And we'd done a heap of media interviews. I was on the footy show, and we met each other on the footy show and was... You know, it, it was it wasn't nice. It was pretty uh, kind of embarrassing, and I don't know. I just did all these media interviews, and then I got an absolute pacey at the MCG, and then Mick just come up to me afterwards, and he says, "Look, you know, if you had your week again, what would you do different?" And I was filthy on myself because I I got caught up in the build up of it, and I was doing interviews. I first time I've spoken probably to the age and. You know, the Herald Sun were ringing me every day. So, this is, so I made this all is these the Ali Frazier. This is the Ali <laughs> Frazier thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then um, we won the game. Was it? We, we won the flag that year. Um, we won the game, but like Duck alluded to before, he dominated me, but West Coast won the game. So Mick was happy because we won the game and their best player completely dominated the game, yet West Coast won the game. So Mick said, well, we'll beat you by, uh, you know, um, uh, by, you know, our sheer brilliance of, of, of a team balance, you know, or team overall performance, not just on one individual having to worry about one player. Surely, I mean, you, you still got to, you know, pay the respect and try and beat him. But um, when it's like that, and like you said, when it's um, like that, you just – you got to rely on, you know, you, you don't roll over and swap with Michael Brennan or um, Ash McIntosh. I think he's playing on John Longmire. So, you know, you've got two big power forwards. Um, so you just got to do your best and sink. Uh, while you're sinking, you're going to fight your way out of it. That was the mentality out of it. Whereas these days, they just swap over six different opponents. And if someone kicks two on you, you'll blame someone else for it. And would you do, would you agree, Jacko? And I know this is how I felt, but it was at the start. It was a it was a hatred, a, oh, yeah. a hatred. And then what happened as time went on? So Jacko beats me, and then I 
I kick a few on him and then it, it sort of goes back and forth a little bit. And then all of a sudden you just have an enormous respect and it, so, it, so it evolved into an enormous respect. And, you know, I remember a game um, at Subi where, and I think we won the game, but Jacko, you ended up going off, you're injured. I think you might have had an injury that year. We win the game, I play well. But I went straight over to him on the boundary, shook his hand and just said, look, understand you, you weren't at your best today, um, but well done. So it all it, it changed, didn't it? It morphed into a, an enormous yeah. respect out on the ground. Well, yeah, and it's, it's you know, it's interesting you say that because I, I do look back on it. And not only just our rivalry, obviously it got more attention, but, you know, I had some good rivalries with Stephen Kernham, probably, you know, towards, he was coming towards the back end of his career, but we had some good jewels with him. Um but yeah, that, that that's I guess pivotal because we achieve so much individually and collectively as a group. Um, and towards the back end, yeah, we become a bit I don't know uh, mushier. You know, we, we were a bit we we started to like each other, which um, I prefer that first five or six years because that got the best out of us. Yeah. Um, hate's a strong word. I, I no, don't no. say I ever hated no. you at the time, but. By G, I wasn't going to give you, you know, one inch, you know. It was trash talk, you know. Found out about a few things that Wayne was doing, um, you know, in his private time uh, in Melbourne. So well, I used well, to well, raise well, them on a footy yeah, field. So. And, and in saying that, so you mentioned before about – so it's true, isn't it? And I, you, you told me this or I've heard this somewhere, that during your whole football career, you never, you never had alcohol during the year at all, not, not once. Yeah, no, that's correct. So come New Year's Eve was my last drink and I just felt if I want to be the best that I could possibly be, um, I wanted to uh, – hang on. Sorry, I'll just get rid of that. Sorry, boys. Um, that's on silent. Sorry. Um, yeah, so New Year's Eve was my last drink and until our last game. So that was my commitment to my team and more so for myself. But I just felt – is Wayne Carey drinking between that period of time? <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> He's Stephen Kernahan. That was just my mentality, you know, because football was my kind of uh, get out card. Well, how did you get along? Um, how did you get along with the rest of the teammates if you weren't going out and? and... I, I went out still with them. I was still part okay. of the team. If yeah. they went to rumours, if they went to you know the tunnel, I went with them, and I was probably doing myself uh, an injustice because I was just drinking a heap of, um, you know, soft drink or Diet Coke or whatever. Uh, but I never left my teammates. I always went with them yep. and uh, always doing, trying to do my best stuck as you do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I could probably hold a better conversation. I don't know. But, um, yeah, so I, I just – I did that. Um, I look back on it and probably I should have had a couple of mid-year – uh, blowouts when I look back at you know some of the pressures that I was going through, especially in those years when I was carrying a few injuries. But that was me. That was me. You know, um, rule or me core value that I wasn't going to, um, you know, I wasn't going to uh, uphold that. Uh, one of our sort of values here on the Truth Thirds that Wayne sort of been, uh, I guess, central to his message since we've started this program has been sort of our honesty and 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 being more and sort of at past. Uh, episodes, I guess. When you talk about your, your going out and how you were a non-drinker as well, I mean, you, 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 as a club, it's been well documented what's happened off-field. How do you, you marry that up now when you have, uh, I guess, situations with like a, a Ben Cousins or, a, or or the really sad news with Chris Mainwaring, who was a premiership teammate of yeah. yours? Oh, yeah. look, everyone makes choices, don't they? And um, you make decisions on, you know, um, how you want to live your life and behave and uh, and so forth. How do you marry up? Um, some players need to that. We remember, um, you know, Maney, for uh, for an example, he used to Thursday nights go out to the racket club and have a few drinks with his, uh, with his workmates and colleagues. And then Friday we'd have um, captain's run and then Saturday we would, we, we would play. And that was Maney's ritual. And he'd get, you know, 35 off a wing, kick two and it kind of worked it was kind of accepted back then this today it wouldn't you know it be uh, accepted especially on six day breaks we used to fly a lot mainly used to sleep a fair bit on the plane um which you're not allowed to do anymore because that disrupts your sleep patterns you got to hydrate mainly was good at hydrating it was just it was just a different liquid form <laughs> you know? so, but it got him going you know what got me going was knowing that i had a clean bill of health i was always pretty healthy guy um, with my dietary intake because I just 
you know, I feared my biggest fear in life was not making it at AFL level. That was all chips in for me. I had no trade. Uh, I finished my mechanical uh, apprenticeship. Well, I didn't finish it. I just I said, no, nah, I got drafted. I can't do the two. I need to be playing footy. I need to be training. I need to build my body. I need to, you know, I, I want to make it. And that was my, I was all chips in. So for me to do that, what was going to, you know, um, stop me from doing that? You know, drugs and alcohol can have an effect on you. There, there's no doubting that. So so how you married up, look, um, horses for courses, mainly it worked for him. Certainly didn't work for me, but it was amazing. Every time we went out, I was always one on one with Maney, uh till till you know the last man standing. But I'm drinking soda water and he's drinking bourbon and coke. So um, you know, I, I always still went out with me mates. Uh, that was that was imperative. Now, I, I guess another big part of your career, when I look back at highlights packages and that sort of thing, as someone who maybe didn't see all of the footy in the nineties, but saw the the highlights, was a moment at the MCG in '93. Doesn't involve Wayne. Involves your brother. <laughs> yeah, involves, yeah, your, brother. Involves, <laughs> your, involves your brother. I'm sure this is probably second to, or might be, might even be before being asked about Wayne when you're when you're out and about, and people ask you about that moment where he just lands one on you, big, big kiss. Um, how do you? I guess you weren't laughing at that at the time, but now maybe you can look back at that and, and have a bit of a laugh. Yeah, well, it's just all these famous incidents that happen. And it's got nothing to do with me playing footy, you know, <laughs> like playing away uh, incidents. My brother kiss, kissing me at the MCG. Uh, so, oh, look, me and my brother, you know, we're very close. We 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 just kick the footy end on end uh, in the in the market garden in the in the eighties. And Wayne obviously saw my brother play, but my brother was very good both sides of his body. He could kick left and right. And he was an enigma. He was a goal-kicking machine, loved kicking goals. Um, and the one thing that I learned from my older brothers, which you do, um, you learn a lot of good things. Uh, you know, you may learn some bad things as well. But one thing that Alan did, um, he always kicked left foot. Now, he was a we were predominantly right foot kicks. And he was just as good on his left, but he just practiced end on end, kicking left foot. So as we grew up, um, he went to Melbourne and I went to West Coast and uh, we had a massive rivalry uh, with Melbourne um, from the Jimmy Steins incident, uh, breaking uh, Dwayne Lamb's arm in a game in 1990, played each other in the finals a few times. They knocked us out in the 1990 series. We knocked them out in 91, the year Jimmy won a Brownlow. But then um, my brother kicked, uh, I think, six in that final. Um, so we, well, so I'm developing a, a rivalry with uh, Wayne at North. Or, or we already had one with Melbourne, and my brother was on the other end of, uh, you know, uh, on the other uh, on the other side. So the trash talk that me and Wayne put on, um, Jimmy Steins, the great Jimmy Steins, he couldn't believe that two brothers could say the things that they said <laughs> to each other. And it was all referenced to our days in the market garden. Um, there was a particular uh, uh funny uh well um uh, a movie that we used to watch as a kid so um it was called the exorcist and uh there was some references in the exorcist that we used to say to each other on footy field and jimmy steins just shook his head and he says you jackovich boys he says something fucking wrong with your family you can't, <laughs> you can't talk to each other like that you know so um so yeah and then that 93 um we were once again, uh, we'd lost to uh, North in that wacky game. Um, we're going through this premiership hangover. We played Melbourne in the MCG, and we lose. We were leading all day, and my brother pops up and kicks three in the last five or six minutes, and he kicks the winning goal. I happened to be standing on the mark. I don't know how there was a changeover, and they're racing. I think the Phoebe boys were racing to the goal square. I don't know why they were doing that because my brother wasn't going to pass it to them. He was about 55 out. And he's just planted this big, big drop punt. He's kicked the goal, put him in in front, which they win. And he turns and kisses me. So another infamous yeah. day on the MCG, we lose. Um, and my brother, and from there, it's just everywhere I go, and especially when I go to Melbourne a lot, I get a lot of Melbourne supporters come up to me asking about my brother because they loved him. Um, and, you know, what a great player he was. But if I don't get asked first question about my rivalry with Wayne Caron, probably be number one. The second question I get asked is about how was that day when your brother kissed you? So, you know, so, so it wasn't pleasant, but um, good good storyline, you know, good folklore in footy and great rivalry with Melbourne that we had at the time. So all in all, 
Anton, we've gone through a few of the games, and I've I know you've got you know. So what are, what are we agreeing here that I won the battle or or has Jacko won the battle? Well, one or? website I went to suggested that that Jacko won the battle seven six with a few draws. Seven six. So that was on the draw. mongrel punt. So, so that's I don't know if we, so seven. So that's the official. There you go, Jacko. So we're, we're how we're, can you have a draw? We're going to put it to bed. Well, does Ali ever have a draw? Um, well, I tell you, well, well, I, well. If you want to use the uh, Ali Fraser, there was once one of their fights. I think it was the Thriller in Manila, and they were both sitting in the corner. Neither were going to come out, but in the end, Joe Fraser's corner stopped it. It went the fifteen rounds. They both went to hospital afterwards. It was one of the it's one of the greatest fights of all time. So, right. and apparently, if Fraser didn't come out, Ali was that cooked right. as well. He was probably not going to come out either. So that. That's as close to a draw as you'll ever get. But so we're saying that Jacko. So that well, that I'm just going by this this one bloke who's got his website on the mongrel pun. It's seven, called, six, he said seven six seven six with a couple of draws. Oh, well, what are you I, okay. Well, I'll finish. I'll finish it off. Well, well, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to say it was seven six with a couple of draws. So therefore, I, I'll I'll concede and say that. Jeez, that's very. I'll, con- I'll concede, but I will. But I'll finish with this. Can you we send talk me about this recording? It is much. It send is, me this recording. It is much easier. It is much easier <laughs> to punch the ball than it is to mark the ball. All right. So, so I'll I'll finish. I'll finish with that. Before we, and for that game at the Waker, you said I had twenty nine possessions. I had twelve marks that night, didn't I? Oh, yeah. I haven't got that. Yeah, so right. yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. yeah, yeah. Well, so, well, that, I wasn't hey, punching that night. Was no, I? but that's well, that's one of your wins. <laughs> but before we uh, before we go, I want to talk to you about. Uh, uh, West Coast at the moment, Jacko. I know you made yeah. a few comments a few weeks ago about uh, Simo, and you're quite strong in those comments. Um, I've, I've, look, being such a great club for a long time, I've never seen the club as low as it is now. So, what are your what are your thoughts? Yeah, the thoughts are how to get to this um, situation. Um, you know, they they are. They are uncompetitive at the minute. Um, everyone keeps talking about their injuries, but they've been talking about their injuries for a couple of years. So, okay, that's a fact. And people will look at it. So, well, when, you know, 30% of your sides on the, you know, of your main core groups on the sidelines, um, I, I, I don't know how long that can last for. You keep saying, you know, the good players are on the, on, on the sidelines. Well, there's a reason why they're there. And soft tissue injuries, impact injuries, um, you know, the kids are not coming on uh, as well as some, are, you know, would like. So I look at their development program. I really question where's their football development program been in the last couple of years. So who's in control of that? Is Trevor Nesman in control of that? Is Adam Simpson in control of that? Is the SNC coach in control of that? Football department is football department. And I believe that's, that's head by the coach. And what, you know, what they've rolled out in the last 18 months is – you know, it's not acceptable. And um, they've got 11 games between now and the end of the season. That is a lot of football. We've only just ticked over the halfway mark. Now, Duck, if it was three games to go and they're in this predicament, you say, all right, you know, send these guys in for surgery, play the kids, and we get to the finish line. I mean, the finish line is a long, long way away. Um, you know, uh, there's some aging stars there that they've put a lot of faith in on big contracts. So that they need to do some adjustments and they need to do it very, very quickly. Uh, how they've let such a powerful club, very financial. They talk about they talk about some of the rhetoric that I hear, which kind of disappoints me a bit. Um, uh, we've got 106,000 members. We've got four Premiership Cups. We've played all these finals. We've got a, you know, a, a bank balance that's looking like this. I don't think that sits well with the punters that keep paying every week. And then you see some insipid performances, which has been... Um, mentioned by the coach, um, that performance, you know, doesn't sit well with people. And they've been saying a few white lies out in the media about the Matt Nui situation. That Simo puts his hand up, and says, "Oh, I probably should have been a bit more truthful about that. We got that wrong." Um, you know, uh, on the weekend we did a pre-game interview uh, before the Adelaide game, and uh, I asked one of the assistant coaches, um, uh, you know, I try to. You know, t- talk it up positively in the in in the pregame, and we asked right at the last question, um, "Is the team you know settled? Uh, are you going to start it?" And um, I won't mention his name, but the assistant coach said that, "Yeah, no, all good boys um, starting as lined up." Now, four minutes later, exactly four minutes later, the team sheet comes in, and Jake Waterman's out because he's sick. 
And I just felt a club that was so good in getting their backyard organised and they were so good on and off the football field. And to have these little white lies, there was nothing to gain, but Adelaide was still going to win by 100 points. But I just felt they could have got a win and say, look, boys, I know the team sheets are in in the next five minutes. I'm just going to give you a bit of a scoop. Uh, Jake Waterman hasn't come out because he, he had a virus. He wasn't feeling that well. And we would have thought from a media perspective, gee, that, that, that's, that's smart. But blatantly lie to us and say we're starting as lined up and then we get the team sheets four minutes later, that's where they're at. They're not tricking anyone. Uh, you're not, yeah, you know who you're bluffing, you know, and I, I just think that that was really disappointing, um, and that's how they're playing. So who's who's responsible for that? You know, I, I'm not going to blame Adam for that because that that's a media disaster. Then they had the Dugowie situation when they put on on the you know, on the Twitter feed. Oh, there's four weeks in that, or you know, and then they quickly took it down. So the the messaging out of the club for all the little wins because they can't get any big wins at the minute. Not going to win the MCG. They're not going to beat. Collingwood, they're not going to beat, you know, um, Melbourne or the Western Bulldogs, but try and just get your backyard organised so you can build on that. And I just, I just think they're in a they're in a place that they've never been before. That I've been associated with the club and watching the club, and what are they doing about it? Um, we'll see over the next eleven weeks, but there could be another three to four, maybe five hundred point losses. How is that sustainable? If they lose the next three games. They'll have the worst AFL record on history, worse than Fitzroy's. Who is responsible for that? Yeah. That's what you've got to ask. Well, Jacko, thanks for some great insights uh, on West Coast there and on your career. It's been a privilege for me to sit alongside Wayne yep. today and listen to you two guys uh, chew the fat. Um, I guess it's been a pleasure. Probably no surprises in what's come out of either of your mouths in terms of what you. <laughs> What you're expecting? But I think I might have. Well, have, have I admitted that he, he won? Yeah, it was incredible. I, I couldn't okay. believe it. Seven yeah. six. Oh, I'm just going off what your your sheets there. <laughs> well, I brought my little stat book here, oh. right? so oh. it's all in here. I've I've I kept record it over the years, Shut right? Up. And it was not too much dissimilar to. Um, what was that guy's name? Where's he from? The um, the mongrel punt was the website. The mongrel punt. Yep. So he's he's. Pretty, uh, pretty much on the ball. I had mine at eighteen two in my favour. So, yeah, <laughs> we're pretty close. Eighteen two. <laughs> and Jacko, I noticed you went fishing the other day, and we're talking about our rival. You, 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 you take it too far. Like I, I sent him through. <laughs> I put on Twitter, and obviously put on the podcast, and I, and you you listened to the podcast a week ago, and you saw that I caught a tuna. And what did you do? Basic. What's the first thing that you did? Well, I responded on, uh, on on text saying, "Duck, we use that for bait." I mean, it was a tuna about this. <laughs> Is it and please, if you're gonna if you're gonna go fishing, and you're gonna post a fish, catch something decent. So that's what he did. He sent me. He sent a video of him <laughs> catching a marlin, and said, "We use that fish, so you, your first tuna for bait." <laughs> and I, I just thought that that sums up that sums up the that's, rivalry. That's another win for me. Yeah, this is going to continue to the win. day you guys die. You're just going to be one-upping each other. Well, thank, thanks again, Jacko. Great stuff thanks, on boys. the truth, Ertz.